On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I couldn't be better, Tim. If I was any better, it'd be illegal. <laughs> well, that's that's not appropriate for a crime show, Lance, as you know, true or otherwise. Let's stay on the right side of the law. And uh, in this episode, Lance, we're speaking with our friend and co-worker, Jennifer Amell, who has done some research on the disappearance of Crystal Bailey. And she even spoke with Crystal's sister, Michelle. And Crystal Bailey's situation, her story is a little bit different from the other ones that we cover because there doesn't really appear to be an obvious crime involved. Uh, she is missing. She has been missing since February 25th of 2017 from Plainfield, Vermont. And as you listen to the circumstances around her disappearance, you'll understand that this is a very solvable, achievable uh, case study. And we just want to give a big shout out and thanks to the Vermont State Police, who Jennifer Mel had the pleasure of speaking with uh, for this this research and this case. Um, that's how you do it. Wow, uh, this is this is impressive. I will, I have to say. Yes, got to give a shout out when uh, when it's appropriate. Absolutely, specifically Detective Amy Nolan, who Jen was speaking with, is very forthcoming with all the information. And I think that does go back to her seeing uh, Detective Nolan seeing the good and how productive something like this can be, and and knowing that there could be an answer here, and she can close the book on it because this is one of those cases that keeps her up at night. So she sees how this can be again something very productive. Absolutely. And this case came to us by way of private investigations for the missing lands. Of course, we're on the board of the nonprofit started by Bruce Maitland, father of Brianna Maitland, missing teenager, also from the state of Vermont. And we are doing a fundraiser, Lance, for billboards for the disappearance of Erica Franilich, which, which is the first case that PIs for the Missing actually undertook officially. And uh, Greg Overacker, the private investigator, did everything, all of his work pro bono. And now we're looking for billboards to put up, two billboards to put up in the area of where Erica went missing in rural New York around the area of Middleburg, New York. So it's a really a short price. We're asking for $1,800, but obviously anything additional is wonderful. That'll all go right to private investigations for the missing. You can donate at GoFundMe, and there is a link to donate in the show notes. You can also check out whereiserica.com. Right. And the GoFundMe, again, you said it is $1,800. That is for the two billboards that will be erected for four weeks with the possibility of a fifth week included on that. But $1,800 doesn't have to stop there. Uh, if you want to give more, if you see that we have achieved that goal, give more to that because we can put up the billboards somewhere else. We can put up the billboards for longer. We can use that money for more of the investigation into Erica's disappearance. And this is where we need the support of the public. We take it only so far financially and through the media and through the shows and through research. But this is where the public needs to step in and help us out and, and give us a small amount because any amount really makes a difference. And if we get 1800 or if we get 18000 I mean, either either way, we'll, we'll be grateful for and, and very appreciative of anything we can get to help put Erica's 
story to rest. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. And check out all of our shows at crawlspace-media.com and follow that Twitter account at Crawlspace Media. You can get all the show information and any updates on the fundraiser as well. Okay, welcome back. It's been a while since we've heard from Jennifer Amell on our airwaves. Jennifer, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm very glad to be back in the crawl space talking about another very interesting missing persons case. Yeah, great work putting this one together. Uh, We're talking about the disappearance of Crystal Bailey, and you did a lot of work on this very thorough presentation that we're looking at as we go through this episode with you. Um, Can you just give us a little bit of background on how this one came to your attention? Yes, this uh, this case was submitted by Crystal Bailey's sister, Michelle. She wrote in to Private Investigations for the Missing, asking us to please cover this case. We then extended the offer to do a podcast episode to try and get the word out about Crystal's um, situation, because it's a little bit of a different case than we've covered Uh, before on missing. And did you speak with Crystal's sister? I did, yeah. I had a long conversation with Michelle. Um, It was a great conversation. She was very candid, and you could tell that she was just really missing her sister. Okay, and Crystal's statistics, she's been missing since February 25th, 2017 from Plainfield, Vermont. And she is classified as lost slash injured. And Plainfield, Vermont is located relatively close to Montpelier, which is the capital of Vermont. That's, I would say, northern central. Would you say that it's like northern central Vermont? Yeah, I'd say that. Okay. And lost slash injured is the classification for her status right now. Where do we get the injured from? Due to the circumstances of her disappearance, she was involved in an accident which led to her disappearance, and she is believed to have been injured during that accident. So that's why we have that classification. It's different from endangered, because a crime wasn't necessarily believed to have been committed. Ah, okay, that that makes sense. And she was a white female, 29 when she went missing, so she would be 33 today. Some of the distinguishing characteristics of Crystal... Brown hair, green eyes, her ears are pierced multiple times, and it says that she once had a broken leg. Um, This isn't in any way related to the accident that you mentioned, though. No, this was a prior injury, but I imagine that it would show up if we were to locate her remains, that there was a fracture in one of her legs. I'm not sure which one it was. Okay. And Crystal had tattoos. She had a butterfly. She had a rose on her thigh with the name Ariana and the name of another child. Part of the tattoo was unfinished as there were two blank spaces in the vines for her two remaining children's names. And she was wearing a pink tank top when she went missing. I find it a little strange that we don't have a better description of what Crystal was wearing at the time of her disappearance because it was February. It was... Uh, They were having a bit of a warm spell in Vermont at the time, but that doesn't mean it was like 80 degrees. It was probably like 35 or 40 degrees. Um, So she's only described as wearing this tank top, and I imagine that she was probably also wearing a coat or a hat or, you know, something that would protect her from the elements. But that's the only description of clothing that we have. That is interesting. Is that the first thing that popped up that you noticed was a little bit peculiar? This was taken directly from the police's uh, case file Yeah, that she was wearing a pink tank top. Did you communicate with law enforcement? I did. I had several conversations with the detective Amy Nolan of the Vermont State Police. And one of the first things that she said to me when I first spoke to her on the phone is that this is her bottom drawer case. This is the case that keeps her up at night. She thinks of it constantly and she really, really is desperate for some closure for this family. Um, She was um, very candid about sharing all the details from the case file. I think that had a little bit to do with the fact that there isn't 
a crime or a suspect in this case, but merely that a person is missing. So it was good to have all of that information and to have good cooperation from law enforcement. Was she cooperative with you right off the bat? Did she have to take some convincing? Because that's a, a pretty unique situation that you put yourself in. That's a very uh, fortunate situation and, and, and cool relationship to maintain. Yeah, it doesn't happen all the time with all of these cases. I think kind of the party line with law enforcement is not to talk to the media and make it very difficult for them to get information. But this was a completely different story. Uh, Detective Nolan was very happy to speak and she made time several times in her schedule to, to speak with me. She even got out some old case files and looked up details that she was a little fuddy, fuzzy on in her memory and was uh, very direct and confirmed um, specifics about the case. Well, that is so cool to hear. Thank you so much, Detective Nolan. That is very appreciated uh, from this side of the, uh, of the Zoom. And where does the relationship stand now? Uh, is she uh, expecting you to reach back out with further questions? Is she um, looking into more material or information to pass your way? As we left it, this case is cold only because it relies on more organized searches of the area. Because the belief is, is that Crystal's remains are in the area where she disappeared. So it's, it's less about chasing down leads and that sort of thing that we're used to from law enforcement and more about um, organizing or getting the resources together to organize another search. So I imagine that uh, both Crystal's family and law enforcement would be in contact with us if another search is to be conducted in that area. Perfect. Okay, let's get into the narrative here. Crystal Bailey grew up with her mother, her sister Michelle, her brother Michael in Florida. Tragedy struck early for the family, however. Here's a quick clip from Jen's interview with Michelle, Crystal's sister. I lost my brother. I lost mm -hmm. our brother. Um, he was actually murdered when he was 13. Oh, my um, goodness. After all of the trial and everything, um, we left Florida to try to start over. Yeah, I don't blame you. That's horribly tragic. And now you've lost your sister, too. And so they... they um, convicted a person for his murder correct they convicted his father his father yes my stepfather oh my god did you live with um the stepfather I, I was adopted by him but yeah oh, gotcha okay were you witness to this murder yes oh oh my goodness that's terrible so yeah i definitely don't blame you for trying to start over in vermont what year did you guys move to Vermont? 97. And then you guys were just there. Did uh, Crystal move around at all or was she mostly in the state? So Crystal moved back and forth from Vermont and Florida. Okay. So at the time of her disappearance, was she living in Vermont or was she just visiting? She was living in Vermont. She had been okay. living in Vermont for about three years. Okay. All right. So she was pretty established in yes. Vermont. So on July 15, 1994, in a rural part of Clark County, Florida, Crystal's 13-year-old brother, Michael, and his father, Moody, got into an argument in the tool shed. According to Moody's testimony, he was trying to wrestle away a 22 semi semi-automatic rifle from Michael when it went off and struck Michael. As he tried to secure the safety in place, the gun went off twice more, both bullets hitting Michael as well. Their mother, Kathy, loaded Michael into the back of the pickup truck and drove about two miles down to the nearest gas station. Michael did end up dying as soon as EMTs arrived on the scene, and Moody Collins was charged with second-degree murder. Rightfully so, I would, I would think. Yeah, I don't know how a gun can accidentally go off and strike its target three times by accident. Years later, in 1997, Kathy and her two daughters decided to make a fresh start in Vermont. And Crystal, unfortunately, struggled with substance abuse for much of her life. She had a few brushes with the law, both in Florida and in Vermont. During this time, she also gave birth to four children. Do we know what the um, brushes with the law were in regards to? Was it drug-related? Some drug-related stuff. Um, she was also involved in something in Vermont where there was damage to property, and she fled the scene um, as police arrived. So she was about to go to a hearing for that incident before she disappeared. 
On the night of February 25th, 2017, Crystal was hanging out with her friend Ali Duda at Crystal's boyfriend's house. Uh, his name's Brian. At one point, Crystal and Ali decided to run out for more alcohol or perhaps maybe to score more drugs and continue partying. Both were intoxicated and they got into Brian's 2004 Ford Taurus. Ali was the driver and Crystal was in the passenger seat. While traveling along the winding rural Brook Road, Allie lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a guardrail near Cameron Road. After the crash, Ronald Wells was driving down Brook Road when he saw the crashed car. He stopped and called 911. Another car passed as well and called 911, but it is unclear which call was placed first. Okay, so we know that at least two people saw this crashed car, called 911, EMTs were dispatched and arrived shortly uh, on the scene. They managed to see the two women, and one of them, which was Crystal, had a visibly bleeding head wound. Uh, However, presuming that the police would arrive shortly, Crystal and Allie, because they were intoxicated, ran off into the woods. Yeah, I think there are a couple reasons why Allie and Crystal took off before the police arrived. I mean, one was that Ellie had a blood alcohol level that was twice the legal limit and was currently on probation. And then Crystal had actually not shown up to a recent court hearing, which had to do with the property damage thing. And she also uh, left the scene of a crime. And because of this, she actually had a warrant out for her arrest. Um, All of this kind of combined with the poor decision-making of a potential head injury on Crystal's part and being intoxicated on multiple substances, I believe, led these two women to run away from the crash site. And according to Allie's account of that night, Crystal was the one who urged them to run. As they stumbled through the woods, they arrived at the banks of Great Brook. Crystal said, we're going to get out of here, and pushed Allie into the water. Then Allie heard a splash behind her, which presumably was Crystal also going into the water, but she did not actually see Crystal in the water. And where is this account coming from? Is this from Allie's report to the police later on? Yeah, this is the story from Allie's mouth. Obviously, she was a bit disoriented because she had just been in an accident and she was intoxicated at the time. But it seemed from her testimony, and this is through Detective Nolan's recounting of the of the story told by Allie, but it was Crystal who was urging Allie through the woods. And it was only a short distance um, from the road that they had crashed on down an embankment, which led to the river. And I think they were so hurried to get away crystal actually pushed Allie into the water not really realizing that the water was uh, rushing really quickly and that that could have been a really dangerous situation for Allie Um, she did not see crystal go in with her own eyes but she did hear a splash so she's assuming that crystal also went into the water and you're saying earlier that the temperature was abnormally high for that area that time of year Uh, That's what caused the creek to run so high and swift because there was a snow melt that happened in result of this sort of heat wave that that went on in Vermont. Still, we're talking about Vermont in February and jumping into waters that are now risen and, and, and flowing swiftly based on snow water. That must have been freezing. And it's remarkable that Allie didn't suffer from any sort of hypothermia. Was she, was she injured in that at all? Do you know? I don't believe there is any great injury other than maybe some whiplash from the, from the accident. As soon as she pulled herself up the bank, she actually had to grab a tree branch to catch herself from flowing down with the river's uh, current. And she pulled herself onto the bank and like right as she got onto the bank is when EMTs caught up with her and sort of administered care. So there wasn't much time for her to suffer any kind of hypothermia. So how long was she in the water? Just a few seconds then? I imagine, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, she's lucky she grabbed that branch. My goodness. And the police arrived on scene and launched a search for Crystal. Since the water was moving so quickly, they could not and did not perform a water search that night. Yeah, so they didn't go under the water. They had they dispatched no dive teams because it was unsafe to do so. But they did search along the banks of the, of the river. And I don't think they went too far that night, 
being that it was the middle of the night and quite dark. Um, but uh, the first thing in the morning, they had uh, dive teams there and a search party organized to go further down the river in the event that Crystal ended up washing down. And the detective that you spoke with, uh, Detective Amy Nolan, she was assigned to the case right off the bat? Or was this something that, uh, you know, a period of time went by? And what was it determined was the case? What, like, was, is this a missing person at this point? So I believe uniformed officers responded to the actual call, like the 911 call. Um, it wasn't until they couldn't locate Crystal that they got a detective on the case. And I believe Amy Nolan was assigned to the case at that point because she was a missing person at that, at that point in time. Okay, and during the search later, at a fork in the river where Great Brook meets the Winooski River, Crystal's purse was found, caught on some overhanging branches, and inside the purse was Crystal's wallet and some medicine that she needs to take daily. Do you know what the medicine was? I don't know what the medicine was, um, but I do know that it was that it is something that she would keep with her on her person and had to take every day. So if she were to run off into the night, she probably would have taken her purse. Those are some essential items that were left behind. And this search encompassed several miles of the river, all the way down to the dams, and the dams were additionally checked for Crystal's body. Is is it what I'm thinking in my head as far as dams go? Like, are we talking like big structures that would probably stop pretty much anything? Or is this a, a smaller structure? I believe they were like mid-sized dams. It wasn't like the Hoover Dam or anything. They are on like kind of a smaller type river. I know the Great Great Brook isn't so large, but the Winooski River does widen a bit. Right. But uh, Detective Nolan noted somewhat morbidly that when there's a body in water, sometimes the gases build up in a corpse and that causes the body to float. And if that were the case, then the body could make it over that kind of dam. And the river does eventually empty out into Lake Champlain. So it is possible that Crystal's body did go over the dam and make it all the way into Lake Champlain. It's possible. And Lake Champlain is huge. It's a huge area to search. And have they ever found um, any bodies in Lake Champlain? Oh, yeah, several. Um, Michelle was... uh, keen to note that whenever there's a story of anybody found in Lake Champlain or anywhere in that and those rivers that lead to Lake Champlain she is like the first one to look into it and call the police about it but unfortunately there has not been a match to Crystal's body and here's another clip from Jen's conversation with Michelle a couple of months ago there was remains found in an area that would have been possible for her to be located in the beginning, the detectives believed that it fit Crystal's description um, as, mm-hmm. far as height and weight and um, some of the locations of the tattoos. But that was as close as we had gotten to it being a real possibility. I imagine that's a pretty emotional journey you have to take each time something comes up. It is. Yes. And Jen, did Detective Nolan speak to you about if she ran Crystal's financial and bank info? She did, yeah. I mean, they had to sort of consider the idea that Crystal is still alive and that she might be leading a life somewhere else. So, yeah, her financials were definitely run. And um, Detective Nolan did talk to family and friends, both in Florida and in Vermont, to see if there was any sighting of Crystal. But... Uh, Her financials had not been touched and nobody had seen her. So it is uh, law enforcement's belief that Crystal did die that evening. Any uh, cell phone activity? Nothing like that either? Nope. Her cell phone was never recovered either. And it's the family's belief uh, that's the same, that she might be somewhere in the water? Yeah, that's what they believe as well. Um, It takes a lot to kind of give up the hope that a missing loved one is not out there living their best life. Um, But due to the circumstances of Crystal's disappearance, the accident and uh, the fact that she might have gone into this rushing river in the middle of winter kind of points to the fact that 
she might have been she might have gone under uh she might have succumbed to hypothermia she might have been more badly wounded in the accident than we ever imagined and she she yeah she probably did die that evening and is somewhere in that stretch of river or in lake champlain and are you aware of who might be taking care of her four children at this point yes um So Michelle, Crystal's sister, is taking care of two of Crystal's children. Um, One of their fathers has one daughter, and Kathy, Crystal's mother, has another one of the children. So they're thankfully being taken care of by the family. And the phone number to the tip line is 1-844-848-8477. Yeah, hopefully that the hopefully Crystal's family and her children can get some closure in this case because I I can't imagine having an, a, a quite a mysterious event like that take place and not knowing where their mother is or where she could have ended up. So I really hope that her remains are recovered, um, and hopefully we'll hear from law enforcement or the family if they do uh, decide to organize an additional search this spring or summer.